So today we are going to talk about uh, a condition called SIBO, and we're into these acronyms today, uh, and it's known in its full verbiage as small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and it seems to be getting some legs not only in the um, uh, research community, but now it seems like it's starting to get out there in the seminars and the magazines as, as as being a real entity that people should be aware of. So I'm Dr. Martin Rutherford. I am a chiropractor since 1979. I am also a certified functional medicine practitioner, which is more pertinent today to what we're going to be talking about. This is Dr. Randall Gates. I'm a board certified chiropractic neurologist as well as being a chiropractor. And for those of you who haven't watched our 100 or 120 hours or how, how many hours we've done online now at this point, sharing what we know and what we have found in our practice with you, we uh, have melded our two disciplines of functional medicine and functional neurology into um, what I believe is going to be a, uh, a, a new paradigm or coming paradigm for uh, chronic pain and chronic conditions. And in doing so, we have developed a chronic pain practice pretty much on its own, kind of developed on its own. And we've come across a, a number of subjects over the years that we've been working together that have shown to be particularly useful in accomplishing our purposes in, in either um, improving or getting rid of people's chronic pain conditions. And uh, SIBO is one of the more recent ones. And uh, so what we do is we give you our viewpoints and our understandings of it and how it, how it, uh, um, and, and how it applies to the types of things that we do. The types of things we do are fibromyalgia, peripheral neuropathy, chronic fatigue, dizziness, vertigo, balance problems, uh, migraines, uh, restless leg syndrome, and more. <laughs> and it seems like SIBO can be, um, can be involved in, in all of those. It can be. It's not involved, always involved in everybody, but it can be. So it's kind of a, a, a soft subject that we feel conversant with. The last two weeks, for some reason, seems to be SIBO uh, weeks or months for me because it seems like everybody that's coming in here either has signs of it or we went and did a talk uh, mm -hmm. Saturday morning. We were invited to do a talk to a, a very nice group uh, who, who, who does uh, laser hair removal. And we were talking about why these ladies, mostly ladies and some men, get this excessive hair. And at the bottom of it can be, in many cases, can be this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So that's kind of the setup. That's where we're going with this. I guess the next thing to do would be to tell you what it is. What is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? And, uh, and then we can kind of go from there with some of the already developing urban myths about how you take care of it or what it means and try to tease that out for you and then get into some of the more specifics about what can be done about it and what it affects and, and whether you might know whether you have it or not. If, if you're watching this, somebody must have told you that or you must have looked on the internet or so on and so forth. So so what is it? What's SIBO? I, at this point, I usually defer. He is our technical advisor here. He does. 99 and 9 tenths percent of the research <laughs> that you get attached to these uh, to these presentations, and so I will defer to him uh, at this point. What mm -hmm. what is SIBO? SIBO, as you commented, is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and basically it's this relatively newly acknowledged phenomenon where there's too many bacteria in the gut. There are many ways to test for it. And, and is it just too many bacteria in the gut, or is it too many of a specific kind of bacteria? It's really too many bacteria in the gut. They're trying to speciate it, but they haven't had great results with it. The reason why is that the gold standard test is for them to actually go into the intestines, pull out intestinal fluid, put it on a Petri dish, try and speciate the bacteria that way, except, I mean, that's basically a surgery. It's very expensive. Uh, it's laborious. It's hard to do. Now you see why I'm having him explain. <laughs> so then they've started coming up with these breath tests, which is where you basically breathe into this device and it tells you how much, they're called glucose hydrogen breath tests, how much of these gases are coming from the gut because these bacteria produce gas, basically. And that's the way that we're beginning to quantify whether someone has SIBO or not. Okay. So we have good bacteria and bad bacteria in the gut and you're saying this is an excess of just bad bacteria? 
You we're can not, think of them as bad bacteria. And you know, that's the hard part about SIBO. A, SIBO is newly acknowledged relatively right. in the GI community. Right. B, in the GI community, as you acknowledge, it's just getting out there amongst gastroenterologists in terms of full practice. C, it's really kind of a continuum. I mean, the, for those of you who have watched many of our talks, right. you've noticed that we talk about the gut a lot. And the gut relates to many disorders. We should just call ourselves the gut guys. <laughs> Maybe we should at this point. <laughs> we should. If you watch our stuff, it seems like it all starts there. Yeah. And so there's this continuum of we see how the gut relates to diabetes. So they're showing that there's a bacterial issue where pieces of bacteria go from the gut into the bloodstream. Some are arguing that there's an overgrowth there. Um, and then those pieces of bacteria interfere with how blood sugar and insulin work in our system. And then it can range as severe as SIBO where there's just too many bad bacteria and then people are getting symptoms of IBS. But we're gonna cover other conditions today associated with SIBO as well. And you just, and you just kind of morphed into what I was going to interrupt okay. and say, which was we, when I started out with this years ago and we were doing gut, the, the diagnosis was basically irritable bowel syndrome for everybody who right. came in here. Right. And, and their tests were normal, their colonoscopies were normal, mm -hmm. their endoscopies were normal, everything yeah. was normal, and yet these people were having diarrhea, constipation, bloating, yeah. gas, the whole thing. And, um, and, and, and since then, we have come to work with virtually every type of a gut problem you could imagine, diverticulosis and, and celiac and uh, Crohn's disease mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And I guess you could argue that this aspects of this could be involved in virtually all of those. Yeah, conditions. and actually we attached some articles on that too. And then I want to elaborate on that in that in the literature they refer to these as functional gastrointestinal disorders. So things like Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, that's inflammatory bowel disease. That is stuff that the gastroenterologists love to treat. Right, so those, are treat. those are major GI disorders, right. whereas SIBO and IBS are referred to as functional gastrointestinal disorders, and that's why we see them so frequently because they seem to respond to functional treatments. If functional. We want to say it that way. However, it were the functional guys. Maybe, maybe that's what we are. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm in a mood today. I'm trying to stop. However, For those of you who are already let me know that I should stop. <laughs> <laughs> However, we're now seeing that these things like functional gastrointestinal disorders, like SIBO, are being observed in things like ulcerative colitis. Crohn's to a lesser degree, and we attached some articles on that. So, okay, so and we did an article, and we did something one time called uh, "Alternative Medicine: Beware of the Cookbook." And it seems like everything that comes into us, there's some sort of a cookbook because the uh, the doctor has gone somewhere and uh, mm -hmm. and learned one thing in some seminar, and then came back and tried to apply it to all his patients. This is a complex issue. So, relative to that, let's talk about the uh, the new. Uh, the new understanding promoted by television commercials and vitamin companies that if you take probiotics, everything is going to get better that's in your gut. Um, that's not true. But let's talk about probiotics and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth versus antibiotics. Because if you're checking SIBO out, we're going to assume that you've done some, some research or some, or you've talked to somebody, or your doctor has talked about it, or or, or something. So, um, so our goal is by the time you're done today, you'll know as much about it as anybody, whether you're a doctor or not. So, mm -hmm. and so once the scientific community started grabbing onto the fact that the gut has such huge importance in health, um, from a number of different perspectives, people started saying, "Well, could we just use probiotics? Let's put some good bacteria in there." And they actually observed some good results in a number of disorders. Right. Uh, I attached an article today with something on chronic liver disease, and it, I think the probiotics helped uh, the SIBO to a certain degree, but it didn't really help the liver disease. That was just an example. But the analogy, and there are really now two main fields of thought, um, where either we put good guys into the gut, where the gut is overgrown, and let's hope the good guys take over, or we kill all the bad guys, and in that process hope that the good guys are still left, they start to repopulate. Good guys there. being different, good back, good, good guy bacteria and bad guy bacteria. You mm -hmm. start talking about fecal infants at some yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. And basically the analogy is, you know, do we put uh, a bunch of good people into, let's say, a dictator-run country that maybe is, you know, killing people, things of that nature, is that going to work? We go more towards the camp of let's kill the bad bacteria. 
that's the camp that we're in. And we believe in probiotics at the end of the process, but that's where all of our literature has pointed us to. I'll right. we'll say it that way. And then relative to the fecal transplant, if you have a parent who's in their 80s or a grandparent, you know that when they take antibiotics, there's this risk of getting C. diff, which can cause them to have diarrhea. It's a type of bacteria. And they saw that some of these people would be even resistant to antibiotics. So this bacteria that was an opportunistic pathogen. So basically, let me back up. So let's say you're 80 years old, you take antibiotics, and then all of a sudden you get diarrhea 10 times a day. That can be due to this one bacteria called C. diff. And C. diff can be resistant to other antibiotics. So sometimes there's no way to really treat it. So the only way to treat it is to take basically bacteria out of someone who's healthy and put it into the gut of this 80 year old, as an example. And that's called, uh, you take good bacteria, and this is called a fecal implant. Exactly. Starting with, people are starting to get to know what that is. Exactly, yeah, or fecal transplant. So basically, we put the good bacteria in, and then that can help the person with C. diff. In fact, we're on the West Coast. We're in Reno, Nevada. I always forget to mention that. Not that it's important, but we're in Reno. We're not far from San Francisco. We're, we're just a drive down the road. It used to be three hours before California fell apart. But, <laughs> <laughs> but now it's about a seven-hour drive with all of the road problems and all this type of stuff. But the bottom line is, uh, like Stanford, we've had a lot of patients in who have gone to Stanford. And, mm -hmm. and Stanford's all over this in mm -hmm. a sense that they're doing the fecal implants. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can talk later about that. And, okay. But uh, yeah. And then so that's good bacteria. And and the reason I talked about, and asked Dr. Gates in the beginning was a good bacteria or bad bacteria because of this theory of should you put more good bacteria in there or bad bacteria in case just on the outside chance that they miss it. Probiotics is is good bacteria therapy. What Dr. Gates was saying is we are in the field, we are in the camp of the get rid of the bad guys. Exactly. And and and, and we're in it because that's what we do that's what we see. Exactly. That's what we see. We've tried probiotics. It, there's the same clinical results as yeah. killing the bad guys. And then you know some of the other experiments we've talked about on other broadcasts uh, relate to weight loss. So they've done studies in obese individuals where they take basically the bacteria out of the gut of someone who's lean, put it into the gut of someone who's obese. The obese person loses weight, and then if the obese person starts eating the standard American diet, rich in saturated fats and processed carbs, then they their bacteria actually shift back to the way they used to be and they gain weight again. Feeds the bacteria. Mm -hmm. the, our diet feeds yeah. the bad bacteria. Maybe this will be our third book. We are our bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about our first book being out in October for about two years now. <laughs> I think we're halfway through it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that could be our third book two or three years from now. So uh, SIBO. Do, yes. You want to talk about more specifically relative to, to irritable bowel syndrome? Yeah, and so SIBO gained a lot of notoriety for the IBS folks. Irritable bowel syndrome patients compromise about 50% of a gastroenterologist practice. There's a lot of people out there with IBS. And, and, I, and I have a couple period. of friends who are, yeah, who, are, who, are yeah. who are actually patients of ours. Oh, you made the comment, well, it's starting to be well known in that field as per the Stanford, but I can't say that my acquaintances are well acquainted with and these are some of the yeah. they work with the two biggest uh, gi gi places in mm -hmm. in northern nevada so it's it's just seeping yeah it's there. just coming out now and you know so it used to be with ibs they'd say oh watch your stress then it turned into watch your stress and now let's put you on the fodmap diet the fodmap diet is a diet that is low in certain types of carbohydrates that seem to feed these bacteria in the yeah, gut the associated with sure. ibs yeah. and ibs is a complicated process we did a whole hour and it relates to it can be after infections that people develop this bloating constipation or diarrhea or alternating constipation diarrhea uh, it can happen with severe stressors stress, stress relates to yeah. it they're showing that SIBO relates to it they're showing that intestinal permeability can be associated with it yeah, allergies. Allergies. So making gut syndrome food allergies there's a this big thing with gluten now there's this yeah. now they're not talking about gluten but gluten's relating to depression I mean it goes on and on right. so it's, watch it's, that an, it's an evolving yes. understanding but now SIBO is being acknowledged and basically what the medical community is doing is that they're giving patients rifaximin which is a rifamycin derivative antibiotic that's locally acting in the gut they usually give it for about two weeks and then that seems to wipe out the SIBO and some of these patients with SIBO feel better for a while for a while and usually the literature is saying that the IBS patients who do best with this treatment 
are the ones that have constipation rather than diarrhea. So. And the reason that it only that works well for a while is because of all of the triggers or perpetuators that Dr. Gates was right. just talking about are not removed. Exactly. So if you and keep eating the same diet, to be right. made aware of it. Bad bacteria. So so now the bad bacteria just comes back. I mean, your system, your system technically, biochemically doesn't really change certain patterns in your lifetime. So one of the things we found was um, our goal when we're treating with patients is by the time we walk through a case like this, we are we, we, that we have the patient's physiology understood so precisely that when we're done, you can give them an exact diet and, 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 and what, whether they need or botanicals or supplements or not, we try to keep it to a minimum and say, do not change, <laughs> just keep doing yeah. this. And if somebody calls back two years later and goes, man, I'm not feeling good, we say, bring your sheet in that we gave you, and sure enough, they'll have changed something. So they're eating stuff they shouldn't be. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So that's so you want it. So so SIBO has wide ranging effects. And I'm gonna I think I'm gonna make a statement that I don't think Dr. Gates is gonna argue. I think I think we don't even really begin to know what all the effects are at this point in time because it just really became kind of a kind of really out there maybe just a year or year or two ago, uh, something along those lines. And so the research is being conducted and there's a lot of research on it as, as you can see in Dr. Gates's attachments. Um, some, we're gonna talk about some of the things that we see. We, because Dr. Gates is um, a board certified chiropractic neurologist, we do a lot of neurological work. Um, and we have seen Parkinson's patients. So Dr. Gates thought it would be interesting to elaborate on small intestinal bacterial overgrowth um, with Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Very interesting. I mean, so who would think that the bacteria in the gut relate to Parkinson's disease? And we've attached some other articles that talk about leaky gut syndrome with Parkinson's disease, but let's get into it. Basically, what they're showing is that when you get too many bad bacteria in the gut that are overgrowing, when people take the Parkinson's medications, they won't be able to absorb the medication well. And so they'll get these what are termed motor fluctuations that are more pronounced when they have the SIBO. What's a motor fluctuation? Motor fluctuation with Parkinson's means that they may have more off time with their medications, which means, again, that their tremors will be more, they'll feel more stiff for longer periods. They won't feel the good effects of the medication as much. And what the medical community is trying to do is trying to figure out other Parkinson's medications, basically, that will be delivered that will bypass the gut or will be absorbed better through the gut so that these effects of the SIBO are not encountered. However, it raises the question, well, could we get rid of the SIBO and help these people? Right. <laughs> and we have a patient right now that we're treating who is a close friend of yours who I haven't even told you about. But we have, uh, no. Okay. It's another one. But basically, we haven't even done a lot of neurological work with him because he chose. No. <laughs> wow, I got a lot of close well, friends that are patients here, apparently. I'll explain later. Okay. But he has Parkinson's, and in essence, he is feeling markedly better with nutritional therapies. And we're not saying that we have the cure for Parkinson's. Parkinson's is a tough condition. We're very upfront with him. You know, basically, it's a condition of decline. And right. he feels that he has not declined at all since he started into our process. So very interesting. Um, and addressing his gut was one of the biggest things that we did. So we're also seeing that SIBO can have implications in terms of those of you out there who have gallbladder attacks or gallstones or your doctor's telling you that you need your gallbladder yeah. out. Yeah, I was just going to say this is a big deal because in our world, we do evaluations. We do just a, we do a complimentary consultation on patients before we ever start treatment in this office because we deal generally at this point in time, we just have seem to draw very complex cases. And so and insurances don't smile upon alternative medicines in a lot of in a lot of states. This being one of them, so uh, we want to make sure that if a person's going to be coming in here and they're going to be spending their hard-earned dollars here and they're going to do what we tell them to do, they're going to get better. So we do very very thorough just initial consults. Man, I cannot tell you how many people have had their gallbladder out. It must be it's like a hobby in this country or something. <laughs> getting people's gallbladders out. And so this is a big deal because one of the reasons, for those of you who don't know, yeah, this is totally getting off the track and it isn't. One of the reasons that people get their gallbladders out is because they have a bad thyroid and they're not aware of that. And just to make a short story short, bad thyroid, things slow down, gallbladder slows down, doesn't function well, and then bad things start to happen. If you have a bad thyroid and you have SIBO or you have SIBO, I mean, 
I mean, the answer for having your gallbladder out, unless it's about to kill you, is, is almost never to have your gallbladder out. You know, it's, it's, it's almost always to start seeking for why it is that way. So this is very cool. Very cool. This is very cool because we're seeing results in people who were supposed to have their gallbladder down and so on and so forth. And, and, and this is actually even more of a direct hit on the gallbladder, I think, than the thyroid. But we see most of our patients, many of our patients, have both. Right, very true, and I don't want to. I'm going to touch on that, okay? Because basically, in one of these articles that we attached, they talked about how the SIBO causes increased serum bile acids, so it's more for the gallbladder to try right. and process, so then that forms the stones, and then also they're showing that hypothyroidism causes SIBO. That's one article I didn't attach. If you want it, I'll find it, but I, I found it. That is and I huge. lost it in my clipboard. That so. is huge. Yeah. Because because in my evaluation, if someone starts telling me, well, I, my gallbladder's out and I have constipation and I have irritable bowel and all that, if you have a slow thyroid, okay, things are going to move through more slowly because everything, your gallbladder's not pumping as well, your liver's not clearing as well, your peristaltus, the stuff that moves the food and the muscles through your intestines doesn't work as well. So it makes sense that, it, that the small yeah. intestinal bacteria exactly. overgrowth that probably should be, shall we say, not developing if things are moving through properly would be related to a thyroid. And I, this first I've heard of that. Okay. Well, and what you said is exactly it. But, That's what they're talking about. But how, do we, the but how do I know that? Because we've only seen it about right, exactly. a thousand times. Exactly. And you understand human physiology. And basically what they're showing with all these SIBO patients <clears throat> is that there's decreased what's termed ileocecal transit time. So basically, the stuff that you eat is not moving through your intestines fast enough that allows the bacteria to overgrow. That can be associated with hypothyroidism, can also be associated with stress. We have a number of patients right now, I know a few of you are watching them <laughs> today, where basically the stress slows everything down because GI motility slows down, then the bacteria overgrow, and then we get constipation again. And then we're talking via email at 10.30 at night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, yes. So that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and by then, the way, the bowel thing that, that people are coming to realize that is a big deal. Uh, the, the Chinese figured it out about 5,000, about 7,000 years ago, actually. There were actually writings in China from like 5,000 BC saying that your, your, your gut is your second brain and other writings that say fire in the belly, fire in the brain. You were talking earlier about, about people would have a hard time understanding why the gut might affect Parkinson's right, right. and stuff like that. So we're rediscovering uh, some old knowledge um, yeah. and, and it, it's really kind of fun. It really exactly. is kind of neat because it works because it works consistently. But it, but, but as you see, Dr. Gates is talking about a lot of different things that can be, uh, that can be present at the same time. So if you, so if the patient gets online, uh, puts in a number of symptoms, SIBO pops up, you read SIBO, you go, oh my God, this sounds just like me. You go to the doctor, the doctor's like, let's say the doctor's advanced at this point in time, goes, oh, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna do a, a fecal implant. Right. Or the antibiotics. Or the refactment. Or the refactment, mm -hmm. or we're gonna do that. And they do it, and you feel great, you're all excited, and it comes back. I can tell you, you don't feel great because these patients that come in here, what that means is, it just means there are other things going on. Right. It means there are other things going on that you have not taken care of, that you haven't been involved with, or that need to be healed. And I think maybe it would be kind of fun, even though we're, the next topic you want to do is how is small intestinal bacterial uh, di diagnosed, maybe you could dovetail those in, in a way. Okay. Maybe you can. Uh, yeah, I can. And let's, let's tell a story. We'll do a patient case to bring those okay. two together. Okay. So basically, we she was diagnosed with uh, SIBO. Basically, she had the breath test, the glucose hydrogen breath test. It was diagnostic. She also had a lot of methane. Methane is shown with more of the IBS type C with the constipation. And she went through a treatment that seemed to help her symptoms, basically. However, then it came back. She'd been on the Rifaximin as well as some other meds, or uh, natural meds. And then it came back, went through a major stress. And then uh, we were reviewing some of her her records and saw that she had a parasite that had that was untreated okay. so then we start her into um, our treatments for the SIBO and basically just know the constipation was the major issue uh, in her problem 
starting into our treatments, things go the other way, let's let's say it that way. So now we're talking, she has diarrhea within two weeks of, of our treatments. And at that point we say, well, you know, the one thing that's still in there is that parasite and that parasite most commonly causes diarrhea. And now that we've eliminated the bacteria, um, the parasite has to be addressed. The parasite gets addressed, she starts feeling better. Now we're not out of the woods yet, but I thought that was a really nice case just to dovetail what you were saying because lots of times these things come back, lots of times there's other things going on that have to be explored. I think the lay public it needs to understand going back to alternative medicine, beware of the cookbook. Right, exactly. I think the public needs to understand that, you, that, that there's a lot of things that can be going on in your gut. And when you go somewhere, have somebody Gut, by the way, okay, I forget. That's stomach, pancreas, gallbladder, liver, small intestines, large intestines. It's the whole shot. And so uh, what the paradigm needs to come to, whether it's medical or whether it's alternative, is that when you walk into somebody's office with a, a gut problem, everything needs to be evaluated mm -hmm. at once so that you can determine all of these different things. If Dr. Gates didn't do the test and find out that she had a parasite, when it went to diarrhea, it would have been hands up in the air. Okay, let's give you something to stop the, to stop the right, diarrhea, right, exactly. but not fix the problem. Right. And, if, and, and if, if you have one of these things, it's rare. If you have SIBO, it's rare, that's the only thing going on. Would yeah. you agree with oh, that? Oh, totally, totally, 100%. So how is it diagnosed? You started to go into the diagnosis of the, uh, of yeah. the breath test. Yeah, so basically the gold standard, and I alluded to it before, was this uh, this aspiration where they go and they do basically a mini surgery and they pull out the bacteria and then they look to see how many bad bacteria there are and what types. And those experiments are expensive, they're laborious. Those were the original experiments where they used rifaximin, then they treated these patients with this, it's not natural, excuse me, this medical antibiotic and then show that the bacterial load was less. So that was a pivotal study, it's attached. Um, but now because of the clinical utility, we're using the glucose hydrogen breath test. There's also something called a lactulose hydrogen breath test. The glucose hydrogen breath test is second way better. However, the gastroenterology community cannot agree on what the high value should be for SIBO, basically. So they can't agree on what the normal value for test oh, is. Oh, in the lab Just like range. we see. So I thought you meant the cost. <laughs> oh, okay. In the lab range. In the lab range. Okay, so they Just like with thyroid on. antibodies. Nobody can agree on what the thyroid antibody count should be. Well, there's a lot of debate. We'll say it that way. So basically, and we attached an article where it was a gastroenterology journal, and they're discussing how they're perplexed because they don't know what the upper So if you get one of these is. tests and other ones, you might get, the number might be a certain number. And one doctor will say, oh, I think it's normal. And the other right. doctor will say, no, exactly. I think it's not normal. Right, exactly. So that's where that's it's at. Exactly. Yeah. So that's how it's So you're testing, the point being that I was had hopefully come out with, is you're testing, I, you, I guess you could say it's semi-unreliable, semi. Right. In other words, you, gotta, you have to take that test along with the history. Exactly. And the exam and so on and so forth to, to, to do a proper diagnosis. Mm -hmm. What does test cost? You know, I would have to look into that because okay. we don't commonly run those. Usually they yeah. come in. I just know the H. pylori breath tests are like, what, 60 bucks or something like that. Yeah. And I don't, I'm not saying it's the mm -hmm. same test, but. Mm -hmm. We run a different way. test just for those of you out there. We have another test that we feel is ahead of the curve on this that we use. Right. So you might want to share that. And yeah. How is it diagnosed? So basically we use something called a Cyrex Array 2, which tells us exactly how many bacterial components are going into the bloodstream. We can see if the immune system is killing the the proteins that bind your intestinal cells together. We can see if your immune system is killing the smooth muscle involved in the intestines. And we feel this test has more clinical utility for our purposes and yeah. what we're trying to do in terms of treatment. Yeah. And also we can track changes so then we retest our patients and see, okay, how much better is it? And we find that really correlates with how And do you know what the sensitivity of that test is? It's very high. It's by Dr. Bajdani. Right. And he's he's gotten the sensitivities and specificities pretty high in those. This Cyrex lab that uses it, it's kind of considered a specialty lab, and this gentleman, Vajdani, put it together. Um, it can be somewhat controversial. However, he's got a couple hundred pa research papers out there mm -hmm. and a variety of things. He's considered one of the top immunologists in the world. Mm -hmm. And he embraced this and literally started a whole lab for autoimmune problems is what he started the yeah. lab for. And right. this thing started to pop up. He started creating more and more tests. It's a DNA test, isn't it? It's more an antibody test. It is an antibody, an antibody test. test. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so if you're watching, that's the lab, Cyrex Labs. 
and and they just call their labs Cyrex Array One, Array Two, Array Three, Four, Five. This is Cyrex Array Two. Mm -hmm. I think they have like ten or twelve. And it's like now, how much is that? That's uh, like two hundred to two hundred and fifty somewhere. There. Okay, yeah. that's it, and it's worth getting. It's worth getting. I've I've heard that the sensitivity and specificity on that is upwards of eighty to ninety percent. Now I don't know if that's accurate or not, but that means that if it says that you have it, then there's a ninety percent chance that that is correct. So eighty percent or ninety percent chance that's correct. And we've seen it. We've used the data to treat people, mm -hmm. and we get consistent results, which yeah. would suggest to us that it's it's a highly accurate test. And then we gauge our treatments based on how severe that is. Yeah, but we don't need to get into that. Right. Now you had I ileo sequel of valve transit and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and I mentioned to you back in the '80s when I was mm -hmm. doing uh, nutritional work in the early '80s that. Uh, working with Goodhart, he's a gentleman who put together, for those of you who know what muscle testing is or applied kinesiology, he was a gentleman who put it together, and that's what I was doing. Um, the ileosequel valve right. was a paramount among just about everything we did, so I, I, I'm i actually going to be interested in this one because um, this is the first time being become, becoming aware of it. Uh, Dr. Gates is ahead of even the curve in this office. So, so let's talk about ileocecal valve and, and SIBO. And so basically there, they're showing that once things slow down, that transit time to get the intestinal contents through the ileocecal valve. So define ileocecal valve for the audience. Okay. All right. So the ileocecal valve is down in your right lower quadrant. It's basically where your small intestines join your large intestines. Yeah. Kind of where your appendix is. Right. Yeah, and basically there's a little valve there that controls contents moving through there. There's a reflux, basically when you eat, once the contents hit there, that will cause you to feel that you need to have a bowel movement. That's why a lot of people will have a bowel movement after breakfast, so on and so forth. So basically they can go to that location of the gastrointestinal anatomy and see how fast things are moving through there. And they've shown that the slower things move, the more likely you are to get this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And the theory is that when things are moving slowly through the top part of the gut or the bowel, um, or these intestines is the best way to say it, that in that process that allows the bacteria just to have a party. You know, they're club med, things are relaxed, they get to eat whatever they want to, they, you know, populate themselves and that can result in a lot of your issues. Yeah. And yeah. that can be associated with hypothyroidism, that can be associated with stress, because when we're under stress, we do not move things through our GI tract as quickly as when we're not under stress. Right. And we've talked about chronic stress extensively in most of our discussions. We always reference the book, Why Zebras Don't Get Officers by Rob Sapolsky. We recommend all of you get it. Um, so yeah. Okay, and so you talked about how it's diagnosed, all right? And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I, but we diagnose it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. With, we use the Cyrex too. Mm -hmm. Because we're looking at it as a continuum. We're not as attached to saying, oh my gosh, you have SIBO because your glucose hydrogen breath test is at this level. You know, sometimes we were, we will refer patients to a gastroenterologist for that test. That's and what, what about, and, and do you want to talk about like the A1C numbers? Okay. Because I think that's kind of significant. There are a lot of blood testing out there. For those of you who don't know what an HbA1c is, um, it's a blood sugar test. It's a, it's a it's a it's more accurate. It's it's more usable than you getting your blood sugar tested. Most people know their glucose. Oh, my glucose is ninety six. Oh, it's one hundred and ten or whatever it is. A lot of people have not been tested for their A1c. The glucose test. I mean, you can take a stick of gum on the way to the you know to the lab and change it fifty points. All right, but the, the, the HbA1c test is a three-month measure of your blood sugar. You can't change it with a stick of gum. It's a much more accurate test. And uh, it's been discovered that you can use that test to also as a marker to indicate a, a possible or probable uh, SIBO. Right, case. exactly. So basically, last year we were at the International Conference on Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine in Oregon. Fantastic conference for all of you watching out there, put on by medical doctors, DOs, there were chiropractors presenting, naturopaths. I mean, everybody was presenting on this topic, and really the top people in the field. 19 I mean, people from all over Top the world, gun, rheumatologists, countries. cardiologists, yeah. nephrologists, 27 functional medicine countries. doctors. I mean, yeah, it was yeah. really, really cool. And at this conference was the first time we had heard the literature, and because it's pretty new, 
where they're discussing the relationship between diabetes at that point and this bacterial overgrowth in the gut. They went on to discuss extensively how it relates to things like arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, to where we can get other populations of bacteria growing in the gut that then disturb how the gut leaks some of these pieces of bacteria in or food molecules in, and that can trigger the immune response in these arthritic conditions. And then we talked about obesity. I mean, it just went on and on and yeah. on, and things like IBS. So that's why we look at this gut issue as a continuum. SIBO is part of it, right. but it's not all of it. And we don't just want to get so focused on, okay, do you have SIBO or not SIBO? We want to see what is actually happening in your GI tract as a fluid environment, seeing how pieces of bacteria are leaking in, seeing how your immune system is maybe killing your GI tract, seeing how this affects food allergies, so on and so forth for your overall health. Now, with that being said, as Dr. Ruther is alluding to looking at the diabetic portion, what they're showing is that pieces of bacteria are leaking in at too high of a rate in pre-diabetes, insulin resistance, many of you know that term, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, this has all been well documented, that is happening. And they're now showing that it is a piece and possibly a major piece in the causative role of all those conditions, yeah. insulin resistance, diabetes, pre-diabetes, metabolic syndrome. And so that's where the A1C comes in because some patients, let's say, can't afford a cyrex array tumor. They can't afford a glucose hydrogen breath test for their gastroenterologist. So they may say, well, I want to know, do I have this or not? And a lot of them are real thin, yet they have an elevated HbA1c that's very much in the pre-diabetic range. They're thin, range. they have an elevated A1c, and they're taking metformin or something right, like that. Exactly. It's still not going down. Right. For those of you who may be watching this or have this situation, this is big. And many would say, well, how do you explain that? Well, some would say, well, it's just genetic. They have a family history of diabetes. And maybe that is it. But there are two frames of thought in the diabetes world, too. One is that diabetes is an unmodifiable illness. Once you got it, you got it. It's genetic. You need to just change your thinking that you're going to be reliant on the medication. And there's nothing you can do about it. Dr. Vasquez presented that article mm -hmm. out of a diabetes journal. And the other frame of thought is actually... Now, with all the current data, maybe we can modify it. And frankly, that's what a lot of people... Well, it's function. not maybe. Yeah, it, it can be modified. Exactly. It, it can be every modified. day. Yeah, it can be modified through strict dietary interventions, through exercise. handling... Yes, through exercise, through handling this bacterial issue, through handling the leaky gut issue. But if you're doing the exercise and you're doing the diet... And, and you're, you're not losing weight. And you're not losing weight, or you're already thin and your blood sugar numbers aren't coming down, this is probably why. And this is why the presence of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth being the this. <laughs> and then that going even more tangential, that's why we got invited to this laser hair removal facility, as, as interesting as that may seem, because we are dealing with patients who have polycystic ovarian syndrome, where these are women who have too much testosterone. They're showing that a big piece of that too much testosterone is the insulin resistance. So therefore, it relates to the guy. And the insulin resistance could be coming from the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So we weren't mean to be mean to the probiotic crowd in the beginning. Right, right. <laughs> well, we said, well, taking probiotics is like, okay, well, good luck. Right. But this is really um, the framework of what you're uh, looking at if you've been diagnosed with SIBO or if you feel like you have the symptoms and you've looked the symptoms up and SIBO has come up and you've read it and go, oh my God, that sounds like me. Or you've gone to get treated for, you've had the fecal implants, or you've had the antibiotic, the Rifaximin, or you've had any of that stuff, and it seems like it hasn't worked, those are the type of people who might be watching this. What we're telling you is this is why. Dr. Gates is a little bit more, there, there's a fine line of walking through saying, wow, you know, we know what we're doing, and, and, and those research guys aren't there yet. But in this particular case, what I can say is, is this is the data that we use, particularly since we attended that concert, that concert, <laughs> I didn't even go to concerts, that seminar, okay, since we attended that seminar, and, um, uh, and we have seen consistently successful results utilizing the data we have. You have to just look at the whole thing. It's not just SIBO. If you have SIBO, there's something else going on that created that SIBO. If you have SIBO, you've gone to take one of the novel, as Dr. Gates would call it, one of the newer treatments, and you felt better for a while, and then it came back, there's definitely something else going on. The something else is going on um, uh, are even more than what we're talking about here 
in certain ways. I mean, you could have hydrochloric acid. You could have anything. You have to look at anything from the stomach all the way down to the rectum <laughs> and, and see what's there. There can be a number of different things there. But if you know that, then you know to look for it all right in the beginning. Perfect example, the parasite issue with that young lady. And it was just basically, we knew it was there. Was it an issue? That goes, the SIBO gets better. Now she's got the diarrhea. Uh, what causes diarrhea that's in her that's in her findings? Parasite, boom. Parasite goes better. It could be intestinal permeability. It could be food allergies. It could be grain sensitivity. Hypothyroidism. It could be stress. hypothyroidism, stress. So you need to know the box that you're working with. And again, go back to alternative <clears throat> medicine, beware of the cookbook because everybody wants to sell you one thing, make a million dollars, and then you find out it works for like three weeks and then it doesn't work. And you know, and there's a big industry out there doing it. We're not anti-alternative medicine. Everybody thinks we're alternative medicine, and we're not. We're not anti-medicine because we work with medical doctors. But we we have to figure out what works. Right. And 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 so because we see a lot of patients, because Dr. Gates is one of the better researchers I ever met personally, um, and and we worked with some of the top people in the field in this putting our framework together, the Dr. Vasquez's, the Dr. Karazian's, the, the research that's out there, the Dr. Carrick's, all these people you may not know about are luminaries in their field. Um, we've had direct contact with them. We've used their framework. We've done the research. This is what works. This is what works. This is how you have to investigate your gut, period. I, almost, I can almost say, I don't care what you have in your gut, whether you know what small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is or not. This is how you need to investigate it. But I think that's pretty cool. Uh, and I think it's pretty comprehensive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Over the small intestinal bacteria. No, I don't think we need so. to say much more. Okay. Well, if he doesn't think we need to say much more, we don't need to say much more. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so there. So that's it. And uh, I hope this was helpful. I hope it's something interesting. I hope it's something useful to those of you who may be looking. Uh, to it because you're interested in something that's going on in your health or in your GI tract or in your gut or whatever you want to call it. And um, if you have any questions, any specific questions, Dr. Gates cannot be your, Dr. Gates is all treated here. Dr. Gates cannot be your doctor <laughs> via email, but certainly he's always been very gracious in answering questions that have been sent to him after we've done these presentations. And, um, and so feel free to do so. And you can see any of our other talks that we've talked about. Any, anything that we mentioned here just about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Yeah, obviously we're doing it now. Intestinal permeability, leaky gut, grains. But if we mention it, there's probably talk about it mm -hmm. on, on, on powerhealthtalk.com. Or on YouTube. Or on YouTube. Yeah. So if you want to you check that out, please feel free to do so. Mm -hmm. Contact us at powerhealthtalk.com mm -hmm. or our Facebook, Facebook page. page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, we will see you the next time. Thank you for watching. Yes.